Oliver is married to Charlotte, their mother and father to Hedvig, or so it would seem. As the story unfolds, relationships are tested, trust broken and loyalties divided. When love is needed the most, it is ultimately denied. Based on the Henrik Ibsen play The Wild Duck, this film explores the price that is paid for love and the cost of concealing it. It's Christian. Who? Hey! Oh my god! Is that all you gotta say to yourself? <laughs> Well, the first scenes of the film serve as a clear reference to Ibsen's work to see Wild Duck being carried away just at the beginning of yes. the film. Um, the story itself has shifted away from, from the play, yes. but not in a good way, because I, hadn't, I had a feeling that it didn't really contribute to a better understanding of Ibsen's work, don't you think? Yes, I agree. It's ironic, actually, because Simon Stone helmed a very successful stage production right. of, right. of The Wild Duck in Sydney, and this is his film adaptation of that play. Um, I think where it falls down is in the scripting, because especially at the beginning of the film, he tries to compress so much information into the dialogue and as a result it becomes too wordy and I think he ignores one of the main conventions of good uh, film storytelling and that is show don't tell. And that's partially because of the fact that he's trying to talk about so many different things yes. at the same time. He's touching on sexuality, on politics, on social injustice in Australia, family issues and so on. Mm. At the same time, staying on surface. Yes. This is only actually diluting the plot. The script needed more time in development, perhaps a few more drafts. Some elements of the story weren't arrived at organically. This created a kind of jarring effect. And then there is a problem with predictability. There are several scenes that are especially weak and one of them is wedding itself. There is no real motivation for Oliver to keep looking for his drunk friend who will then deliver him truth that will basically destroy his life. You could see it coming well before it happened. Yes, I agree. And I think that's, I think that's a, one of the main problems with the whole film. I mean, even the tragic outcome of the, uh, outcome of the film is telegraphed way too early in the beginning. Right. And I think it's, it's, it's made very easy for the audience to work out what will happen. And I think that actually kills some of the tension. Let's talk about Simon's directing work in this film. For, for many of you outside of Australia, you might not know, he's a very well known and established stage director, young yes. stage director in the country. But this is his first feature film. Actually, yes. his debut. Mm. And that becomes upper in, in the department of pacing. The mm. film has a very, very slow build up. Yes. Things start happening just 20 minutes before the end. And that's why the, the climax I felt it, uh, it was less powerful than it could be. Mm, I agree. Um, I still think it packed an emotional punch mm. despite everything. But you know, I think Simon Stone has uh, a great visual eye. I think he knows how to establish atmosphere. Um, I think he knows how to create a sense of time and place. And with this film particularly, he was very lucky with the locations which were excellent and, and used very well. But I think he falls down with some of the creative choices he makes, particularly with the use of, for Voice example, over, voiceover, yeah, which was excessive. That was abusive, I would say, <laughs> honestly. Yeah. Like, those are not really like voiceovers you can imagine. They are like mm. sort of uh, overlays, the dialogues that are unspoken without being in sync with the plot. Mm. Something you, you normally see in music videos, but you don't really expect them in feature films. That's right. Yes. I felt that he used them just because some of the scenes lacked intensity or emotional, yes. emotional punch. Yes, I agree. I love you. I love you. Hedvig is a great girl. She's the best thing in my life. I think he does <laughs> find his funny again in the, in the last half of the film. Um, but ultimately, um, you know, that comes uh, the sacrifice of, of key elements, um, such as, you know, the story, basic storytelling. Mm. Mm. We had some of the best Australian actors on board in this film. Some of them, they are international stars like Jeffrey Rush or Sam Neill. But surprisingly, the best performances didn't come from the biggest names. Mm. Jeffrey Rush had very strangely written dialogue, yes. but his delivery <clears throat> was far from his best. Let's be honest, like mm. some of the scenes were very uh, theatrical, uh, dry and unconvincing.
Mm, yes, I agree. In actual fact, I think uh, with Jeffrey Rush and Sam Neill, they would have both been better served if they'd played each other's roles. Mm, I think the role of Henry, which Jeffrey Rush played, would have been far better served by Sam Neill and may even rec- have recalled his uh, role uh, in the piano. Um, Same film produced by... By Jan Chapman, um, and yes, this, this, as, as this one is too. Um, and uh, I think, you know, the, the character really needed to be sort of, you know, a bit tyrannical, very controlling, and whereas Jeffrey Rush came across as a bit aloof, and so, consequentially, it didn't make as much emotional sense mm. with everything. And, and what about Odessa Young? Very young actress, yes. uh, just starting her career. She had very consistent performance from the start yes. to the end. Mm. She knew where her character is heading. That's right. And especially her relationship with her father was genuinely beautifully done, yes. very warm, uh, tender. You could feel it, mm. isn't it? That's very and true, I agree. And Ewan Leslie as well, he was stunning for the yeah, most, of, the most part of the film. Yeah. However, I felt in the crucial scenes at mm. the end, he was slightly underperforming, struggling to deliver. Yes, I think that may have been because um, Simon Stone had this idea that if he changed the scheduling of scenes around, just to keep the actors on their toes, that would somehow um, elicit better performances. Oh. But I actually think that affected the confidence of the, of, the, right. of the actors. And I think at certain points in the film that comes across because... Especially in the park. Yes, in the car park. Yes, <laughs> yeah. exactly. Which, I don't know, depending on your point of view, is either underplayed or overplayed. Mm. Um, and I think that um, leads nicely to the point that a uh, wonderful actress, Miranda Otto, who was uh, played Oliver's wife, who and Leslie's character's wife, was actually underwritten. I mean, she's wow. a great actress. And she's a pivotal character in this yes, film. Yes. Not, not only underwritten, but underutilised. She really needed to be in the film more. Precisely because she was played a pivotal role in, in, uh, the, in the trajectory of the entire story. That leads us to uh, music written by uh, Mark Bradshaw, Mark Bradshaw um, mm. Australian composer. Very beautiful score, to be honest. Mm. Um, however, it was used without balance and excessively, yes. which uh, makes it heavy and, and kind of um, melodramatic, I would say. Yes, and I, I think it was kind of you know trying to tell the audience how we should feel, especially in the first half of the film, where the tone of the music was a little too sort of ethereal, a bit too sort of unearthly, a bit too um, sort of... Uh, like God's presence. Yes, that's right. As, as if it was trying to convey something of, of, of the nature of, of the story, which was tragic, and that we should sort of, uh, you know, anticipate something of that. Instead of intensifying the audience experience, Bradshaw's score was trying to create one. It functions really as a sort of ancient Greek chorus, placed in the middle of modern Australian drama. Emotional commentary of the plot that kept distracting us from a real dramatic potential, hidden in the narrative. And now we move on to the cinematography by Australian Andrew Comis. I think Andrew does a really great job in capturing something of the Australian landscape we don't often see in Australian no. film. You know, there's light and there's shade, there's fog and there's mist, and there's a sense of cold mornings, which really captures something of the atmosphere of the original text. You know, I, I always thought that Australia is all about beaches, you know, like <laughs> this is completely unknown territory for me. Mm. But on the other hand, I just want to say that the comics great, does great job. And actually, this is the only aspect of the mm. film that mm. never let me down. He recreates that scenery of gloomy and claustrophobic mm. yes. uh, like atmosphere um, that is perfect setting for lives that are mm. anything but open and honest. Yes, that's very true. I think he does that very, very well. Watch out for his color spectrum, uh, for the for scenes that require that like restrained emotions or, or re- revealing something very unpleasant. Mm. He would use these deep blue shades, and for happy mm. family moments, he would use this beautiful saturated imagery. Yes, that's right, and lots of reds and so on. Lots of reds, yeah. And I think it's what what is also nice about his use of color is the fact is there is a kind of absence of it toward the end of the film, mm, that's where, true. where the film is kind of drained of color, mm. and uh, they're in this sort of heightened state of emotion and mm. it perfectly complements that situation. Nonetheless, great job Andrew yeah. Thomas, Excellent thanks for the experience. <laughs>